Good morning, friends. Stephen Benoon here with Israeli News Live and uh, another series here that we're working on, or I should say it is a series about Tovia Singer and his annihilation of the Christian faith of the believers and what they really believe. And I'm trying to unravel all of this mess because he's having a major impact on Christians globally many of them falling away from their faith because of failing to understand the truth about the gospel and of course Tovia is very good at knowing how to just do just exactly that now I don't whether or not he does that intentionally or not I don't really know but uh, he's very passionate about the Jewish faith and but there's a lot of things that he's just not telling you and uh, and so therefore makes it look like Christianity is just horrid and that the apostles, Paul, you know, etc., just horrible people, all bad, all misconstrued the word of God, etc., and even Christians themselves. Uh, so let's get started here. This is our third broadcast we're doing with Tovia, and I will create a playlist on the channel so you'll be able to view these uh, uh, as we go. I just have not done that as of yet, but let's continue on right now. This one here, uh, Tovia is in the old city of Jerusalem. And he is there uh, in the Christian quarter, and he's going to read to you from Ezekiel 36, 26, uh, and also quoting from Luke 6, 28. Let me play first. I want to play this one little clip here first, uh, and then we're going to go a little bit more of what he has to say before I dive into this subject as well. What a nightmare that they're committing against our Bible. Same deal in Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 19. How do you take it out that you'll keep my commandments? And I know Christians are watching this. I know Christians are thinking about this. Doesn't it bother you that the Hebrew Bible says that you're going to keep all the commandments? It's messianic. And that's somehow absent in your churches? Think. Huh? Okay, so he's basically saying that uh, in, in the old city there, they're quoting Ezekiel 36, 26, and that they didn't continue on to verse 27. Well, I would actually say, why not go ahead and continue all the way down to the end of the chapter, for that matter, uh, Tovia, not just to verse 27. But nonetheless, he makes it look like Christians are just totally obliterating the Bible for their own purpose, and that this is horrid and horrendous. Of course, the Jews would never do that, would they? Hmm. Well, you're going to find out the Jews will do that as well, and they have done it on numerous, hundreds, thousands of occasions. Because, after all, there is what we call a Talmud. There is a Mishnah. There is, a, you have the Jerusalem Talmud, which is actually written in Tiberias, but you have that one. You have the Babylonian Talmud. Um, Mishnah was the first. These are your oral laws that were transposed down. And of course, we can go back to around 20 CE, the oldest record that we have uh, known of, where it is spoken that there were two Torahs that were given to Moses. One was written, one was oral. The oral was later put in written form called the Mishnah. The, uh, then we had the, uh, the Jerusalem Talmud, which began, where rabbis began to expound on that, and then the Babylonian Talmud. And then, by the way, the Jerusalem Talmud was written around 200 uh, years after Christ. The Babylonian Talmud was written in Babylon, uh, but it was over a course of a period of, you know, between anywhere from around 200 to 900 uh, 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 in the Common Era. And so therefore, much longer it took for that to get out. Uh, there's another book as well, I forget what it's called, that, that is also part of the writings. But I have all of these, and I have gone through them many, many, well, I haven't gone through the entire things naturally, but been through them quite, quite thoroughly to know that uh, the rabbis, uh, for one, and that the one we're going to be looking at here in a minute is going to be from the Babylonian Talmud, where they flat out tell you that uh, God has no say on earth. Yeah, exactly. God has no say on earth. Uh, and let me just see real quick. I better make that a little bit smaller and only blow it up when I get to the right spot for you. Uh, this is the, the, the discourse between Rabbi Eliezer, where he does, he invokes all these miracles of God. Uh, and, you know, of course, they outrule him. Even though he was actually right and they were wrong, they were able to outrule him. And they end up citing one sentence from the book of Deuteronomy in order to argue their case that basically God has no say-so on earth. 
Hmm. Interesting. Uh, and and God uh, later admits that they are they control him. Uh, let's see. I got to back up. I actually passed it already. No, I passed it now. There. Uh, that's after El, uh, Rabbi Eliezer is repenting. Uh, here we go, right here. This one right here, here we go. This is this is interesting, right? Rabbi Yehoshua stood on his feet and said, It is written, it is not in heaven. One sentence out of Deuteronomy 30, verse 20. Really, that's all he writes. It is not in heaven that thou shouldest say, Who shall go up for us to heaven and, and bring it into us and make us to hear it that we may that we may do it. It is not in hell. All they do is quote one part of the verse. Now, I'm going to expound on it a little bit deeper, so I don't want to lose you on this as of yet. I need to first go back and play a little bit of what Tovia says here. By the way, that's Nehemia Gordon's, uh, where he was talking about this same story as well. Let me play some of what Tovia says here, uh, just so you can kind of see where he's going at. I am in the lion, the Jesus first coming, second coming. This is like a Revelation 5 thing. Let's not look at that for a moment. This is the one that is so outstanding. This is a very famous passage from the book of Ezekiel. There are two passages that are almost identical. One in Ezekiel chapter 11, and the second one, you see here, Ezekiel 36, verse 26. But notice what's not here, verse 27. This is so incredible. So this is a messianic uh, passage, in fact, all of Ezekiel 36, 37, 38, 39, the whole end of Ezekiel, the entire end, even starting before this, is all messianic. So it's telling us that I'm going to give you a heart of flesh instead of a heart of stone. Now what the text actually says is following that, and therefore you're going to keep all my commandments, all my statutes and my laws. So I want to explain this first. The Novi, the prophet Yechezkel, Ezekiel says that I am going to in the future messianic age you're going to be keeping the Torah and what I'm going to do is I'm going to take out that stony heart give you a heart of flesh so you'll be receptive to keep the mitzvahs to keep the commands of Hashem what's the problem for the church the problem for the church is Ezekiel 36 verse 27 the problem is that Christianity teaches that when the Messiah comes meaning Jesus you don't have to keep the law anymore no more law. That's what Paul teaches in Ephesians. That's what Paul teaches in Colossians 2, 16 and 17. Mark chapter 7. The law is done with. That means you don't have to keep the commandments any longer. You got it? So, the, the Pauline Christianity, the Christianity we're familiar with, listen very carefully, is antinomian. It's a fancy term. It means it opposes ritual commandments. I mean, they're not saying that you should go kill people, but all ritual commandments are done with. It's over. No mitzvah. Now, the Hebrew Bible says that when the Messiah comes, you'll keep my statutes and my laws. See the next chapter, Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 24 and 25, which clearly talking about the Messiah, names him David, tells us he's going to be a Nazi prince. Everybody knows it's messianic, and you'll be keeping my commandments. Here is the skim. What do they do here? They only quote here Ezekiel 36, verse 26. I'll give you a new heart. I'll put a new spirit in you. I'll move from your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. That's Ezekiel 36, verse 26. Why does it stop here? It should continue to verse 27. But verse 27, for these Christians, is a nightmare. Because the next verse, it continues. See, there shouldn't be white here. It should continue. And say, and say, and you'll keep my commandments and my statutes and my laws. So what the church did, whoever did this, this is all over the place. What the Christians are doing is, they're taking verses out that offend Christianity, or better, that are incompatible with Christian theology, and only highlighting this. So this is a hard issue. I'm going to give you a new heart. It's going to be a heart of flesh, not a heart of stone. Yet. Okay. As you can see, the basic, uh, the basic principle that Tobia does is he's really trying to, what he's saying 
flat out is that Christians, they only take what they want. It's kind of like the old restaurant Piccadilly's, right? You go and you pick what you choose and pick what you want. That's what you get and the rest you can throw in the garbage can. And this is what Tovia is really trying to say is that the Christians are actually doing that. Um, but the problem is, there, well, there's two problems with this to begin with. One, you have to understand really what Ezekiel is saying in the first place. That's really important to start with. And even for Christians, they wouldn't have to leave out verse 27 either if they really understood what the prophecy is saying in the first place. And we're going to go into that because, like Tovia said, it is a messianic prophecy. In fact, it's so messianic, he really kind of put himself in a very awkward position by putting this video out because I'm going to take and break it down for you the correct way. Uh, secondly, though, he accuses Christians of... Like I said, just choosing and picking what little verses they want. Accuses Paul of the same. Uh, you know, and, and this is the way this goes. Back and forth, tit for tat, tit for tat, constantly. All right. Now, in reality, though, like I said, the rabbis do the exact same thing. Now, I'm going to play a little clip here. I actually, though, I have it open already for you here in the Babylonian Talmud, Bavav Mitzvah. Uh, Medzia 59b and, or A and B, I believe, is actually where this is all at, the story here. Um, I'll, I'll play a little clip there when Nehemia Gordon brings this out here uh, in one of his broadcasts theirs. And um, so you can see, give, get a little bit of a, a more of an illustration about this because <clears throat> the problem is, is that rabbis believe that they have the ultimate authority even over God himself when it comes to earth. And when they made that authority for themselves, it's written in the Babylonian Talmud that give them this authority. They basically took from Deuteronomy uh, and, you know, they take verse 12 and they only take the first sentence. It is not in heaven to invoke their right of authority over God himself. They don't even quote the rest of the verse. You know, so Tovia, when you're sitting there bashing Christians for not quoting the second verse, and this is this is one of many such instances. Here it is right there, plain as day. Rabbi Yehoshua stood on his feet and said, It is written, it is not in heaven. Alright? He quotes it right there. Oops, sorry about that. I don't know how that happened. It is not in heaven. Deuteronomy verse uh, chapter 30 verse 12 the Gemara asks what is the relevance of the phrase it is not in heaven in this context Rabbi Yemaya says since the Torah was already given at Mount Sinai we do not regard a divine voice as you already wrote at Mount Sinai in the Torah after a majority to incline wow in Exodus 23, 2, since the majority of rabbis disagreed with Rabbi Eliezer's opinion, the halakha is not ruled in accordance with his opinion. The Gemara relates years after that Rabbi Nathan encountered Elijah the prophet and said to him, what did the Holy One blessed be he do at that time? When the Rabbi Yehoshua issued his declaration, Elijah said to him, the Holy One blessed be he, smiled and said, my children have triumphed over me. My children have triumphed over me. Now this is considered oral law. This is considered to be absolute gospel in the light of Judaism. And I believe that Tovia, and I'm not going to hold him to it. I have to really double check and see my, to make sure myself but I believe that the Tovia is a Talmudic to Torah keeping Jew. So, and, and, and he's never, from to my knowledge, he's never claimed to be a Karite Jew. If he were a Karite Jew, he wouldn't be wearing a kippah. A kippah on the head is not in the law of Moses, period. Abraham didn't wear one. Moses didn't wear one. Nobody else wore one. So why, would, why, why does he wear one then? It's Talmudic. All right, now, so let, let me give you a little bit of where Nehemiah actually talks about these things here, and I think that might help bless you as well. Um, 
I'm going to just take it to the part where he's talking about this one issue here. And only the rabbis have the knowledge and authority and tools to decipher that divine code. And we've already seen an example of that with the words, it is not in heaven from Deuteronomy 30. The rabbis took only those words, it is not in heaven, out of the context, disembodied them from the context, and imbued them with the meaning that was never intended, that God has no authority in how to interpret scripture. Now let's look at another example, a classic example of midrashic interpretation or rational interpretation. Exodus 23, verse 2. There we read in the Torah, You shall not go after the majority to do evil, neither shall you testify in a matter of strife to incline after the majority to pervert justice. And what this means is that you must not follow what the majority says just because the majority says it. You must follow the truth, even if you're the only one doing that. And if you're testifying in a court case, you must not say that a certain person is guilty just because everybody says he's guilty. You must testify the truth, even if you're the lone voice of reason, because to do otherwise would be a perversion of justice. Very true. Now, this is a very, very important commandment in the Torah that we must follow the truth and not the majority, not to be sheeple, follow after the herd. But the rabbis take this verse, and of course they have the absolute authority on earth to interpret scripture, and using this authority, scripture being a divine code, they arbitrarily take off words from the beginning and words from the end, and what they're left with is the principle, incline after the majority. And in fact, this is a very important principle in Phariseeism, when there was this debate between Rabbi Eliezer and the rabbis. Why was it so what important I just for Rabbi Eliezer to convince the other rabbis that he was right? Why couldn't you just say, I'm a very wise man, you're very wise men, let's agree to disagree. Now, notice like what, again, what uh, Nehemiah brings out in Exodus chapter 23, verse 2. He's going, he's going further, even than what I just showed you. And he's showing you how they take Exodus 20 and ver 23, verse 2, and they take that little tiny portion out. Let me pull that up for you. Because clearly, it's already written... Um, let me get back. Sorry, I'm in the wrong chapter. God says here, Thou shalt not utter a false report. Put not thy hand with the wicked to be an unrighteous witness. Okay? Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful commandment. Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. Right? Thou shalt thou bear... bear uh, uh, shall, excuse me, not, neither shall you bear witness in a cause to turn aside after the multitude to pervert justice. All right? Now, I'm going to highlight it like that. Let me go back over here to where Nehemiah has it in here. Incline after the majority. Let me see. I've got a different English translation. I wish Nehemiah had done it in Hebrew. It would made it a little bit easier there. Um, shall not follow the multitude of evil. Neither shalt thou bear witness cause to turn aside. Turn aside to pervert, to pervert justice. Let's back up and look at his real quick again where we got the full English section of his. You should not go after the majority to do evil, okay? You should not go after the multitude to do evil. That's correct, okay? And then the next part, neither shall you testify a matter uh, of strife. He's just using a different translation. Uh, neither shall you do bear witness in a cause to turn aside. Um, and then uh, to, incline, uh, to incline after the majority to pervert justice. So it'd be the last sentence there. Uh, the, after the multitude, it'd be right here to do to do the ju uh, do justice there. Um, and let me see, because I, th I think he actually takes out part of the end of the verse as well. Let me just make sure of that. Authority on earth to interpret scripture, and using this authority, scripture being a divine code, they arbitrarily take off words from the beginning and words from the end, and what they're left with is the principle, incline after the majority. Incline after the majority, okay. So after the multitude. Uh, to pervert, uh, to, I got a bad, <laughs> I got a, a crazy translation here. Okay, here it is right here. Linatov uh, Okay, and that's what they're using right there.
Okay, so this is what we got going on. Again, <clears throat> the point is, uh, for those of you that are listening to Tovia Singer, uh, this is a man that uh, is telling you this while all the while the Jews are doing a the most injustice to the word of God that could ever be done. You know, and I'm going to show you that because what Paul has done or what Jesus has done or what the, you know, when it comes to the, the scripture of Ezekiel here is not to pervert it. In the cases of the rabbis in the Talmud, they're flat out perverting the word of God. They're flat out saying God has no authority here on this earth. And in this case here, uh, as, as, uh, Nehemiah is stating here, let me just, let me, let me get, uh, or the volume's all the way up. <clears throat> let me back up just a little bit. I want you to really pay attention to this and listen to him again, what he says that the rabbis have done. Listen. Let's not say that a certain person is guilty just because everybody says he's guilty. You must testify the truth, even if you're the lone voice of reason, because to do otherwise would be a perversion of justice. Now, this is a very, very important commandment in the Torah that we must follow the truth. And not the majority, not to be sheeple, follow after the herd. But the rabbis take this verse, and of course they have the absolute authority on earth to interpret scripture. And using this authority, scripture being a divine code, they arbitrarily take off words from the beginning and words from the end. And what they're left with is the principle, incline after the majority. And in fact, this is a... And this is after he clearly shows you that, that scripture is telling you you're not to go after the majority. All right. Now, the clear evidence of that is right here in the Babylonian Talmud. And I will take and blow it up now that we're right at this one part right here, right? Um, as Rabbi Yehoshua stood on his feet and said, it is written, it is not in heaven. So basically, they're going to say that they have the rule over the majority. The Gemara asks, what is the relevance of the phrase that is not in heaven? In this context, Rabbi Yemaya says, since the Torah was already given at Mount Sinai, we do not regard a divine voice, as you already wrote at Mount Sinai in the Torah after a majority to incline. Again, here he does it right there. After a majority to incline. Since the majority of rabbis disagreed with Rabbi Eliezer's opinion, the Halakha is not ruled in accordance with his opinion. You, you, do you see? And Tovia, you're making it look like Christians or, or Paul is so horrible because they took away something. They only used one verse out of there, or, or in this case here, they're in the old city. They only quote one verse, and you said they're doing it for their own purpose. Judaism not only does not just one verse, one sentence out of the verse and reverse the very meaning of the entire thing intentionally. You have to be a blooming idiot not to see that. You know, at least with Christianity, they, they believe they're on the right track. It's not like they already see that Paul talks about, you know, the law, you know, Christ fulfilled the law. Christ came to take away the stony heart. Now, I'm, I'm going to go into that for a moment here, but this is, this is horrible. And so you think that, that Christians really ought to go and follow Torah? Follow your rabbis that say that they have the, uh, the you know, that you're the ones really preserving the word of God when you make a trash of the word of God. I mean, it's, it's, it is the most horrendous thing I've ever seen in my life. Now, but and for, for the sake of Christians, let's take a look at this over here where you're talking about, well, they just threw it all out, right? They threw it out. They, they quote verse 26, and they don't go on to verse 27. Now, Tovia, I'm hoping this will help you, my friend. I really hope it will help you because, you know, you're not even looking at the scripture correctly. Verse 20, let's just isolate verse 26 like the Christians do. And I'm going to show you something, and then I want to take the rest of it and show you a little deeper that might help you to understand what this really means. A new heart also I will give you. A new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. That's not just any type of of stony heart that he's talking about. 
It is a prophecy. Because why? When God wrote the Ten Commandments, he wrote them on two tablets of stone. So when we read here in the Hebrew right here, Ve'asiroti et lev ha'evin. Tovia, you know this as well. Et lev. It's he's he's going to he's going to literally. The it's, the word really is like beheading. He's going to behead the heart of stone. And that word. Et lev. It is, the et is, we know, is that direct object. He's going to, I mean, that, and by the way, anybody that knows Hebrew knows that this is, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an allegory used, it's a term in Hebrew that is used to behead the heart that is of stone. Ha'even. All right, and it's not just any stone, it is ha'even. If you have the letter he in front of that word right there, it is not just even, the stone, it is the stone. So what had happened? A heart of stone had entered into the people. It is literally, what are, what are you dealing with? This goes back to the Garden of Eden with the serpent himself. When he comes to Adam and Eve, specifically Eve in this case here, then he is trying to give her of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And the knowledge of good and evil ends up being the law itself. It tells what is good and it tells what is evil. But the father did not want them having to live by a law that is of stone. The beheading of the heart of stone is to behead the serpent that deceived Adam and Eve in the first place. Because you see, if you have a heart of flesh, you don't have no need to go by a stone or to follow all these laws and rituals and stuff, especially seeing as you have, quote unquote, two Torahs oral and that of the written see that the written one i have a little bit more res i have respect for the written i do not have respect for this oral law that has butchered the word of god in the first place but even within the torah and in this case here the tanakh because now we're looking at the navim the, the prophets you have the uh the, which tanakh is an acronym for you know the torah uh the uh the navim the navim the prophets and the kodavim the writings it's just an acronym that is used in Hebrew to, to express the entire Old Testament. But the Old Testament also is taking and bringing and showing you what is going to come when the Messiah comes. Now, let's back up, though, to see what this is really about. Okay? Like Tovia said, it is a messianic passage. Sure it is. Let's look at verse 20. And when they came unto the nations, whether they came, they profaned my holy name. Who did? The house of Israel did. Let me see if I got anything else highlighted yet. No, I didn't. We can go through the whole chapter and break this down, but it's okay. And that men said of them, these are the people of the Lord and are gone forth out of his land. So God's name got profaned because the 12 tribes of Israel were not in their promised land, as he said he was sending them there to be a land flowing with milk and honey. Remember those arguments that Moses would have with God about that? He said, you know, they will say that you just brought your people out to die in the wilderness and that you didn't keep, you weren't going to keep your word. This is what this is about. But he says, but I had pity for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned. So how do you make, how does God's name, the word profane there? is actually like a term used that would be like, you make his name unholy. Among the nations, whether they came, wherever they came from, right? Therefore say unto the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, I do not do this for your sake, O house of Israel, not the house of Judah, now the house of Israel, but for my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations, where, whether you came. I will sanctify my great name. Okay, I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in the midst of them. Who profaned it? The house of Israel. 
And the nations shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. So how's he going to do it? How's he going to fix the problem? For I will take you from among the nations and gather you out of all the countries and will bring you into your own land. Oh my gosh, you have got to be kidding me. God is going to God is going to make his name holy how? By bringing them back into the land of Israel. All right? Wow, gee, Manetti, Steve. Really? Yes, that is so true. Oh, well, this has not been fulfilled yet. Wrong. That's where we're wrong, right? Remember all these people that are there, the Perithians, the Medes, the Elamites, dwellers in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, all these different places, right? Jews and proselytes, by the way, Cretes, Arabians. Uh, we all hear these people speak wonderful works of God in our tongues, wherein we were born. By the way, that does that's included later in the verse there, not in this particular part. They understood in their own language. They were hearing this great miracle. But who are these people that was hearing this great miracle? Well, what do you know? When Peter comes down further and he has to explain what's happening with the house of Judah, and by the way, that receiving of the Holy Spirit that happened on the day of Pentecost was the fulfillment of Ezekiel. Just, Toby, in case you're missing that one, I want to make sure you get that one there, right there. That's where he's taking out the stony heart and he's putting in the heart of flesh. And not only is it taking out or beheading that, that heart of stone, you have to remember, the house of Israel was the main one that had married in among and mingled the seed, the bloodline. Now, Judah did it too while they were over in Babylon, by the way, in case anybody forgot about that. But the house of Israel was the first one to actually take and go and mingle their seed with these Nephilim races. I wonder why he says he's got to behead that heart of stone. He had, to, he had to clean them up. But he says, I will take you from among the nations and gather you out of all the countries and will bring you into your own land. And I will sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. You know, Jews do the ritual cleaning, going, going to a mikvah. In fact, outside the, uh, the Zion's Gate there where uh, there was one of the old discoveries there of uh, uh, Christian artifacts that were found. Uh, I've, I did a video on this years ago there where I believe it was the church that James had there. There's actually a mikvah right there not far from it where you would go and you would, you would do ritual cleansing. But the thing is, when he talks about clean water upon you, he's literally talking about baptizing them. And we know this because Acts clearly shows as Peter says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Now see, they had already come home. So now God's name is being sanctified on the day of Pentecost because the house of Israel has returned. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. What, what does it say there in the prophecy of Ezekiel? I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean. Peter tells them, in order to get this new heart, you've got to be baptized. There's the clean water. Not only did they, from uncleanliness, from their idols, everything. Then he says, A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. That's where you get the doctrine of you must be born again. So that you can receive that heart. And I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. 
It's no longer that you have to follow the letter of a stone tablet any longer, but because the heart, the Spirit of God is now dwelling in you, you will do that by nature. Even, I think Paul quotes that, the Gentiles by nature don't even, you know, they keep the commandments. In other words, they don't, they don't, they don't steal. They don't bear false witness. They don't. They don't. They, the Ten Commandments, as Jesus said, if He said, if you love the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, mind, and you know, etc., and you love your neighbor as yourself, He said, these two, all the laws hang upon them. In other words, if you kept those two, you wouldn't covet the neighbor's tractor, his wife, his donkey, or anything else. You wouldn't steal. You wouldn't bear false witness. You wouldn't do any of those things. So no, we don't have to take that out. And in fact, I'll prove something to you here about this being the house of Israel and they'd profane the name. Remember when they asked Jesus about the question about how to pray, right? I've got the Hebrew Matthew open for this. So when you pray, do not multiply words as heretics who think that their multitude of words, they will make them heard. That was Pharisees and Sadducees, by the way. Do you not see that your Father who is in heaven knows your words before you ask from him? But thus you shall pray, Our Father, may your name be sanctified. Wow. He was teaching the apostles already to pray for the God's name to be sanctified, which would be what? In order to sanctify God's name, the house of Israel had to return home. He basically was teaching them to pray that the house of Israel would return back home. He also sent them out abroad, the 70 and 2, I believe it was, along with the 12 apostles. And he said, go only into the way of the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Jesus' whole ministry was working on getting the house of Israel back there in the promised land so that on the day of Pentecost, him knowing that this was going to be fulfilled, that, that the prophecy of Ezekiel would be fulfilled then, that that would happen. So he was already teaching his apostles to pray in that manner. May your name be sanctified. May your kingdom be blessed. May your will be done in heaven and on earth. Talk about a perversion that, that the rabbis have done. Jesus knew that they were perverting that too when they, when they, were, when they were saying um, in, the, um, in the Babylonian Talmud that uh, it's not in heaven. Quoting from Deuteronomy 30 and 12, it is not in heaven. As I pointed that out to you right there that thou shouldest say, who shall go up for us to heaven and bring it into us and make us to hear it, that we may do it, right? And the, and the rabbis had already come up with the oral law. It's not in heaven. They throw the rest of the verse away, Tovia. Throw it away completely. They just simply say, the rabbis have total authority on the earth because the Torah was written here on earth, is given to Moses, both oral and written law there. God has no say so in the matter anymore. He is to remain silent. So who's the one that is butchering the word of God? And Jesus clearly, when he says, not only does he tell them to pray to sanctify God's name, which is the returning of the house of Israel, back to the promised land in order to what? To receive, to get rid of that heart of stone, to behead that heart of stone that is in them, but also to receive a heart of flesh so that they could receive the Holy Spirit itself, be baptized according to the scripture, what it actually says. But also he goes on to address the Talmudic thing, although people may not realize it. May your kingdom be blessed. May your will be done in heaven and on earth. Give our, de our, our bread continually. Forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who sin against us and lead us not into the power of temptation, but keep us from all evil. Amen. There it is. Every bit laying right before your own eyes. And the ones that are butchering the word of God, uh, sad to say, but it's not the Christians. It is the rabbis. No wonder why Jesus said about the Jewish people of his day. He said, you cross land and sea to make one proselyte. And when you make him, you make him twofold more child of hell than you are yourselves. The only way, the only way 
to break that curse is to recognize who your Messiah really was and is. And to behead that heart of stone, then you would really be able to keep the law. So you would be able to keep the law. Then you would receive the one that brought the true law, the one that did away with all the Talmudic traditions. How many times did Jesus say, you've heard it said of them of old time, didn't say Moses said it. He said them. What was he talking about? He also talked about many such other traditions you have that make the commandment of God of no effect to yourselves. I, I say this, and Tovia, I have to do these videos here because, and, and, I, and my heart's desire is that it will help you as well because this is just a, and granted, listen, I get, there are a lot of mistakes that are made along the way. Christians are doing the best they can. I made a lot of mistakes myself along the way. I'm doing the best that I can. But somehow or another, maybe this will help people as we go along and that they'll see what's going on. Because listen, I'm seeing it from every side. You know, Tovia, I know we've, 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 we've written each other before over the years. It's been a long time ago since we've written. Uh, but besides what you got involved in doing here, really trying to obliterate the gospel of Jesus Christ, um, we've got another movement that I'm, that I'm doing. I actually ordered the book, The Pyramid Code. Very demonic, the TLS group there. That's another one I've got to really... I've done one video on it already, but... That's so much in the new age and everything else, and they claim not to be a religious organization. They are just as um, Judaic as it comes uh, into everything. Uh, Kabbalah, uh, Zohar, you name it. It's a dangerous organization. And I have seen many of the doctors that are in the movement there, so to speak, being interviewed by this group as well. I've got to expose that issue problem as well. Thank you for listening. Listen, your support of this broadcast is very important, and I, I can't underestimate that enough. We thank you for your support of this work that we do here. God bless you, and may he keep you. Visit our website, israelinewslive.org, our mailing address also above my head there. Uh, the mailing address, I'll say it one more time. The mailing address is P.O. Box 156, uh, Stephen Benoom, P.O. Box 156, Sunbright, Tennessee, 37872, right above our head there. And also on our website, israelinewslive.org. You can visit there. Um, and there has our mailing address to the right. Or you can click right there on our website and donate directly online. That's actually one of the most beneficial ways for us when you donate online. Uh, I, I appreciate those that do it by mail because you'll say, I want 100% to go to you. I don't want PayPal just getting... Uh, a portion of that, and that is greatly appreciated too. Uh, but w because of our travels that we have to do right now are so frequent, it is very helpful when we get that by online as well. God bless you and thank you for, for listening.